Yeah. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to the Ordinary Council meeting of the City of Vincent on the 26th of July, 2022. I will declare the meeting open at 6.02 p.m. On behalf of the City of Vincent, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Following on from that, and in lieu of announcements by the presiding member this evening, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Auntie Ma Margaret Colbung, a member of our Bridge Elders Advisory Group, who passed away on the 8th of July, 2022. Auntie Margaret Colbung was a respected Aboriginal leader in Western Australia and a fierce advocate for Aboriginal rights and recognition. She was a founding member of our Bridges Ad Elders Advisory Group for the City of Vincent and also for the City of Perth. She made an enormous contribution to the City of Vincent's draft Innovate Reconciliation Action Plan. She was never afraid to speak her mind, challenge and question while enjoying a joke and sharing a yarn. Auntie Margaret was born and raised on the outskirts of Narragin. Her mother's nickname for her was Mujidi. She was very smart and good at maths, which led to a scholarship through the Country Women's Association to study business management in Perth. Her first job was for the Department of Native Welfare in Narragin. She also tells the story of helping Aboriginal organisations and communities set up their accounting systems. She experienced a great deal of racism during her time and was a fierce defender for her community. It was due to her experiences receiving health care, she decided to become a nurse and then a community health worker. She was instrumental in establishing the first Aboriginal controlled medical services in Western Australia. In 2021, she was awarded an honorary doctorate of science by Curtin University for her contributions to health care. She was incredibly active in her local community and was passionate about teaching younger generations, working with a Noongar Kids Choir and teaching knitting to young folks amongst her many other activities. She was also well known for her reconciliation beanies that she would bring to meetings as gifts. Auntie Margaret passed away during NADOC week. Her passion, dedication and sharp wit will be greatly missed. We thank her family for allowing us to honour her name today and send our deepest condolences to them and to everyone whose lives she touched. I'd like you to join me in observing a minute's silence to honour Auntie Margaret, Margaret, her extraordinary life and contribution to the city of Vincent and community. Let me set my timer. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll now move on to apologies and members on leave of absence. Um, you'll note that Mayor Cole is an apology this evening. She is on a site visit in her role with the WA Planning Commission. And I believe everyone else is present and accounted for. We'll move on to public question time and the receiving of public statements. There's no set order. Everybody gets up to three minutes and we just ask that you um, come to the microphone and uh, state your name, the suburb in which you reside and the matter in which you're speaking on this evening. 
If you hear a timer go off at the end, um, we just ask that you conclude your remarks. And we um, ask, as always, that um, everybody is uh, professional and um, considerate in making their comments. Can I have the first speaker, please? John Visca, the Chelmsford Road, North Perth. I'd like to talk on agenda item 9.7. Beaufort Street and Grosvenor proposed pedestrian project. I live in Chelmsford Road. There was no consultation. I did not get any communication about this project at all as such. And I was amazed to see that the project traffic is going to be channeled into Chelmsford Road. As a ratepayer for over 40 years in, in Vincent and, and prior to that as such, um, I noted that the cost for this trial is nearly $114,000. Now, we've just had our rates put up, almost double any other council as such, and here we're going to be spending, just for a trial, nearly $114,000. Who knows how much it's going to cost by the time you pedestrianise the, uh, the Grosvenor Street precinct as such. Um, I'd just like to present that, and I just think, I take umbrage at it, at a project like this, that where did it come from? From a grassroots level, or said I certainly was not as part of the consultation process. So I'd just like to bring to your attention, I don't think a council that seems to be not uh, financially um, in front spending money like that. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Can I have the next speaker, please? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. My name's Sean Offer. I'm from Fresh Provisions. I also live in the Perth area. I don't think if I tried, I could have beaten John up here, so I'll let him get to it first. But I too want to speak on the Grosvenor Road trial. And uh, again, I also want to raise my concerns about the consultation and who this Beaufort Street Network group is that supposedly represents our business network. I certainly haven't heard from them for many years. Uh, my primary concerns are to do with the loss of parking. Five parking bays may not seem like much, but a 15 minute base is 20 movements an hour. And at 50 uh, to 70 of those uh, frequent times a week, the numbers add up pretty fast. Uh, most locally ratepayers from the area, not part of the 80% that live outside the area who use the city's parking. The 25,000 saved by the council on a detailed traffic study will cost businesses in the area considerably more as a result of the trials with the interruption that this will uh, cause. The main roads data shows the importance of traffic flows into the intersection, uh, the section between Chelmsford Road and Walcott Street in contrast to what comes through Walcott Street. Management agrees with the importance of the egress and the ingress to Grosvenor Road has for the Chelmsford and Raglan Road car parks. Pedestrian comfort is a good thing for Beaufort Street. My wife and I walk it often. Between Walcott and Beaufort, there are no pedestrian zebra crossings or controlled tra traffic light crossings. Inglewood has them. Vincent Street and Beaufort Street Corner is unfriendly for pedestrians as outlined in the studies. There are no plans here. The Bow Lane and Alexander buildings both have pedestrian malls built into them now, allowing easier pedestrian movement. On Grosvenor Road, there is no street activation from the southern side of the street from the IGO supermarket. And to the north, the area is restricted with a licensed drinking area, complete with bollards, railing and raised floors per a council resolution that allowed this to happen. But it's okay, smokers will not have chairs on the outside. The speed in this section, per the study, says it was at about 20 kilometres an hour. Speed was never an issue in this area. Management's test for larger vehicles. It's one truck a day that operates in the early hours of the morning. It's hardly a true test. The outcomes that are wanted by management is to bring people to an area that management already says is popular. Will food trucks be rewarded for their cheap capital outlay and lack of dedication to a physical location in this area as well? Increased anti-social behaviour would need to be dealt with by somebody, as this will certainly make them comfortable. Does Mount Lawley need its own version of High Street and Fremantle? Will rangers be further stretched with extra duties? They are struggling already to keep up with a large workload now. I also note that the data collected from this trial did not make any mention about collecting data from businesses. I have those points on a piece of paper. If you'd like me to table them, I have copies, but they're my comments. Thank you, Sean. Any further speakers? Good evening, Honourable Mayor and Councillors. My name is Caroline Butt from Perth, 
and I'm here on behalf of Yen Car, owner of 146 Brisbane Street. A petition was organised by Yen and relates to Agenda 5 in this meeting. The petition relates to proposed 469 William Street development, in particular requesting council disapprove the submitted development application on the grounds of four things. The application proposed eight storeys and William Street guidelines permit a maximum height of six storeys. Number two, there are five car bay shortfall being a 23.8% shortfall. Number three, development provides for nil bicycle parking for visitors. Number four, finally, the layout of the development results in bins being present, presented along Brisbane Street, both vehicular and pedestrian. There is four concerns for that. It obstructs the traffic along Brisbane and William Street intersection, both vehicular and pedestrian. There's poor and awful aesthetics. There's health concerns relating to restaurants, cafes, and other food businesses around the area. And find, especially with given COVID-19 situation. And finally, there's also smell emissions with bins awaiting emptying during process of emptying. The petition only ran from 26th to 30th of June, and then a handful of days only already 41 signatures were obtained. Had the petition ran longer, no doubt more signatures would have been obtained. Clearly the public has spoken and the current ap application must be disapproved. The application needs to adhere to the William Street guidelines, height, res height limit restrictions, meet the five car bay shortfall, provision of bicycle parking for visitors and relocation of bins presented for emptying away from Brisbane Street, perhaps to Amy Street, being the rear of the premise where the other bins are currently being emptied. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. We'll discuss this matter when we come to item five, the receiving of petitions, deputations and presentations. Is there any further speakers this evening? Thank you. Hi, my name is Alex Hamilton and I'm a resident of 24 Wilberforce Street, Mount Hawthorne, and I'm here to discuss um, agenda item 9.3, the character areas for heritage areas specifically relating to Wilberforce Street. Um, so I just wanted to start by, I understand that you've all received a briefing document that indicates that support for this one is about 50-50, but I've been through it all and of the survey that we were actually directed to um, participate in it's more like 60 40 so I don't there's about eight emails that seem to be unaccounted for that we haven't been provided with that seem to be duplications of other submissions but if you go through the actual survey um six people were supportive and nine residents were against so that's more like 60 40 not 50 50 so I'm not sure why we would be proceeding with something that 60 percent of the street is against um, so that's kind of my first point um, I also just wanted to raise that my husband and I came along last week and it was kind of when the mayor asked whether um, residents were supportive of the updated um, guidelines that have been circulated to us that we were. We haven't been asked for any feedback and I think I can speak on behalf of a few people that I've spoken to that we're not supportive of them still and to suggest that we are or that even any feedback has been asked of us is very disingenuous. Um, we, my husband and I have continuing concerns about the guidelines. Um, I think it started with a petition before we moved to the area, um, but I think we have concerns that we'd be the only street in Mount Hawthorne with all of these additional requirements. Um, if I let you know, so we live on the end of the street, opposite a car yard, um, a health centre, a laneway full of like commercial rubbish from Biraz and Yellow. Um, an old house that nobody lives in, that the roof is falling off on one side. And um, the house on the other side is like a 50s, 60s, also abandoned that no one lives in. So I think the idea that we wouldn't be able to like in 20 years time when everyone has electric cars put in a carport that we could charge our car in because we're in a character area when we live opposite a used car yard. It's a bit like beyond me. Um, there's no uniform character nature to our street. Um, and these restrictions, like City of Vincent already has great planning laws and restrictions that are in place that apply to the whole of Mount Hawthorne. Um, there's no reason why our street should be sort of given additional restrictions. Um, and obviously from the survey responses, um, the majority of our street doesn't actually support this. So I would urge um, either to not proceed with this 
or to go back to the street for more formal consultation, preferably from every um, street. There's only 25 of us, I think, um, on the updated guidelines rather than sort of suggesting we support them because they definitely haven't addressed all of our concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Hello, um, my name's Tina Lee. I live on 17 Wilberforce Street in Mount Hawthorne. And uh, I would also like to speak against agenda item 9.3, the character street uh, and heritage of Wilberforce Street. Um, again, I, like Alex, um, believe that the consultation process just was not very uh, well handled. Um, when the petition came through, uh, which the council planning team have told us was community led, we weren't given much information about what this meant. Um, instead, we were asked, I think, uh, do we like character homes? And of course, we love character homes. We live in Mount Hawthorne, like that's why we built, bought into the area. So I believe that most people on our street love character homes and we do not need a specific set of guidelines to tell us like what we should and shouldn't do with our homes. Um, I think everyone on the street has respectfully um, observed building guidelines and uh, just the aspect of characters in the, in the street. So I don't believe that we need additional guidelines to um, be enforced on us, um, especially I'm worried about future generations that it will affect given that, you know, it only required, you know, 40% support for the petition to go through to planning council, um, but 70% support of the street for it to be redacted it at any time. So I feel as though those numbers just don't add up. Um, so yes, I would just urge you to take um, note that the majority of the street has um, said that they're not in support of the policies. Um, and yeah, that, I'd like you to consider that. Thank you very much, Tina. Is there any further speakers? Yes, please come forward. Hello, I'm Marie DeWitt of 15 Wilberforce Street in Mount Hawthorne, and I'm speaking about agenda item number 9.3. Uh, I have already sent through um, an email to all the councillors that I uh, could find, and so I'm not going to read the email that I sent in, in total, but I would like to just read a small portion of it just uh, to cap cap everything off. So before the change is introduced, I urge the members of the council to please allow further consultation with residents. As I note, there are 25 residences lining Wilberforce Street and the brief briefing transcript from last week's meeting dated the 19th of July, 2022, refers to 23 property owners having voted on the change. The majority of which 52% voted against the guideline being approved. It is recommended the council supports this matter to be worked through further. Irrespective of a character guideline being introduced, the character of Wilberforce Street will continue to be enhanced by the current owners. At this time, I do not support the introduction of any instrument that will restrict the development and improvement of Wilberforce Street, Mount Hawthorne. And I'd also like to add, I've been there since 1976. And um, I think that over the years, I've watched and, and observed a lot of very good improvements in that street. And the people in that street are mindful of the heritage of the homes that they purchased. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. Is there any further speakers tonight? No? Okay, I'll close the list. Um, I should note that we have received uh, a number of questions and statements via email. Um, Andrew Main regarding item six, confirmation of minutes. 
Ben Farrell of Perth regarding the adoption of the capital budget for 2022-2023 and also Sean Offer sent through an email in relation to the, um, the road closure. I will assume that all the councillors have read all of those items. Um, just in relation to Mr Farrell's email regarding the adoption of the capital budget, I note that he has raised some concerns in, um, around the removal of the um, Stewart Street playground and um, just wondered if it may be beneficial given that I presume councillors are receiving a few emails on this subject at the moment um, for some clarification on the process from here in terms of consultation with the community in relation to this matter. Executive Director, would you be able to assist? Thank you. Yeah, yes, through you, Chair. Uh, yeah, just to confirm that before, I mean, obviously the playground is um, proposed to be removed, but before that happens, before any works take place, there will be a public consultation exercise and uh, the results of that consultation will be reported to Council. Thank you. And I, I guess I, I would also um, be of the assumption that in line with that community engagement policy, that there would be an, a sign on site so that users of the playground will be aware on when that consultation activity is taking place. Would that be correct? Uh, that's correct, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, and I presume that um, the, the other questions that were raised via email will be responded to and presented in the minutes. Thank you. Um, and I note that there were responses to previous public questions taken on notice in the minutes, um, and uh, there's no further comments in relation to those, is there? Okay. All right, we'll move on to the receiving of petitions, uh, deputations and presentations. Oh. Yes, of course, my, my apologies, sorry. We also need to do applications for leave of absence. We have had one application for leave of absence from Councillor Ashley Wallace from the period of the 27th of August to the 18th of September inclusive. Can I have a mover and a second? A move, Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Castle. All in favour to support Councillor Wallace's application for leave of absence? You have to vote too. Yeah, <laughs> I, declare, I declare it carried unanimously. Thank you. We will now move on to the receiving of petitions and deputations and presentations. Um, the city has received a petition with 41 signatures from Yenkar of Perth. The petition requests that council disprove the development application for 469 William Street, Perth, on the grounds that the application proposes eight storeys. William Street guidelines permit a maximum of six storeys. There is a five car base shortfall, 23.8% shortfall, exacerbating scarce car parking at present. The development provides for new bicycle parking for visitors. The layout of the development results in bins being presented along Brisbane Street, obstruction to traffic along Brisbane and William Street intersections, uh, poor aesthetics, health concerns, and uh, odour emissions. Clause 2.24 of petitions in relating to the City of Vincent Meeting Procedures Local Law 2008 provides the following, that uh, every petition complying shall be presented to the council by the CEO. So CEO, you're presenting this to us for the consideration this evening. Um, and that uh, the motions that, the options that we have before us are that A, the submission be received, that the submission be received and a report prepared, that the petition be received and referred to a committee, or that the petition be received and dealt with council. CEO, do you have uh, any advice or recommendation in relation to receiving of this petition? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I might ask the Executive Director of Strategy and Development to explain uh, the nature of this petition and how we'd recommend it be dealt with, including uh, the relationship with council's role in a JDAP application. Uh, yes, through your presiding member, the, so this development application is um, the responsibility of responsibility of the development assessment panel to determine and make a decision on. Um, that development assessment panel is comprised of three specialist members that are appointed by the state government and two council members that are recommended by council and appointed by uh, the minister as well. So for a panel of, of five, um, the administration will prepare a report um, uh, considering um, and including all of the submissions received, um, as well as this petition um, and all of the information in the petition and the number of petitioners. Um, and that will be presented to the, to the development assessment panel for their consideration. 
Um, at that meeting, um, members of the public are able to, to make a deputation um, and present to the, to the development assessment panel um, as, and hear their deliberations and the decision. Uh, so administration would recommend that um, council receive the petition, um, noting that the um, petition will be included in the administration's report to the development assessment panel. Okay. Um, can I have a mover and a seconder for that motion to receive the report? And note that it will be referred to the development assessment panel. Moved Councillor Wallace, seconded Councillor Hallett. Any debate? All those in favour? Passed unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move on to item six, the confirmation of minutes. Um, we're considering two uh, lots of minutes this evening. The uh, minutes of the ordinary council meeting of the 21st of June, 2022. Please note that there is a paper on the desk in relation to a minor amendment to the minutes and uh, the minutes of the special council meeting of the 5th of July, 2022. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the minutes of the 21st of June, 2022 ordinary council meeting? Moved Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Alexander. Any debate? Councillor Alexander? I'll put it, all those in favour? Adopted. Can I have a mover and seconder for the minutes of the, 20, of the 5th of July, 2022? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Castle. Any debate? I'll put it, all those in favour? I call it carried. Is that an issue? No? Thank you. Um, I'd also just like to note um, that tonight is the last council meeting for two of our uh, City of Vincent staff members. Uh, Andrew Murphy, the Executive Director in Infrastructure and Environment is um, departing Vincent for the City of Stirling. And Gemma Carter, our Manager of Marketing and Partnerships is departing for the City of Belmont. Um, just like to take a moment to uh, note their contribution to Vincent and also to uh, wish them well in their future endeavours uh, with uh, their respective local governments. Um, so thank you very much to Andrew and Gemma. Really appreciate it. Oh, there you are. Thanks, Gemma. Hi. I didn't recognise you there. Thank you so much. Um, we'll now move on to declarations of interest. CEO, do you have declarations of interest this evening? To you, Deputy Mayor, yes, uh, four declarations of interest received for the agenda tonight. Uh, one from yourself, uh, Deputy Mayor, impartiality interest in relation to item 9.9, .9, the new lease to jigsaw search and contact portion of Robinson Park. Noting your interest is that uh, you've had some engagement with jigsaw through uh, your employment at the Department of Health. Uh, a second declaration from yourself, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, proximity interest in relation to item 9.4, review of design guidelines and minor amendment to community engagement policy. The extent of the interest being that the Deputy Mayor's property is directly adjacent to the boundary of the Highgate design guideline area. Councillor Castle has declared a proximity interest in relation to item 9.3, character areas and heritage areas for Wilberforce and Kalgoorlie Streets, Mount Hawthorne. The extent of the interest is that Councillor Castle's residence is adjoining the section of Kalgoorlie Street being considered for this item. Councillor Warner declared a financial interest in relation to item 9.7, Beaufort Street and Grosvenor Road pedestrian improvement projects. Uh, the extent of the interest being that the report identifies proposed activities for the Grosvenor Road project, one of which is to project short films, which were produced in partnership with Revelation Perth International Film Festival, noting that Councillor Warner is the general manager of the film festival. That's all, Deputy Mayor. And just to confirm in relation to the proximity interest that I have, that 9.4 has been withdrawn from the agenda. So we don't have, that'll could deal with that another time. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll now just go around the room to see um, if there's any items that councillors wish to pull out for discussion this evening. Councillor Hallett. Councillor Castle. Councillor Wallace. Councillor Iopolo. 
10.1 and 11.7. Thank you, Councillor Warner. Uh, just 9.3. 9.3, yep. Councillor Council Alexander. Yes, as we've had um, members uh, discuss that in the chamber, we will be pulling that up for discussion. Okay, the CEO will, and I will now confer um, to determine if there's any other items that we have to pull out and then we will put forward our on-block motion. Thank you for your patience, uh, everybody. Um, we will now um, move items on block that have not been subject to a question or a statement in the chamber that are not uh, absolute majority items uh, that haven't been pulled out for council for further discussion and that are not subject to a relevant interest. By my list, I have that, uh, uh, that we'll be moving on block item 9.1, item 9.2, item 9.5, 9.6, 9.8, 9.9, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 12.2 and 12.3. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the on block items, please? Moved Councillor Wallace, seconded Councillor Loden. All those in favour? I declare them carried. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, just a note, uh, we, and this would uh, reverse the, the process, uh, we had an amendment uh, requested from Councillor Alpolo regarding uh, an amendment to the minutes for the uh, special council meeting for the adoption of the annual budget. And uh, I myself didn't, I didn't pull that up in time to note that before council voted on those minutes. So uh, my apologies for that. And so when I asked for any debate, that would have generally been the opportunity to raise a hand and, and identify that there was a thing to speak of. Okay, that's fine. Okay, well, can I just please get confirmation that if council has taken a decision and we've adopted the minutes, that we are then procedurally able to then go back and undo or discuss that item? Thank you. We can as long as all the people who were at the original adoption are still in the chamber. 
aka if one of us got up and walked out, then we couldn't consider it. Okay. Thank you for that. Would the uh, executive manager of um, governance care to confirm? Not that I don't trust you, Councillor Loden, but I feel it's appropriate for us to get some, you know, technical expertise. It came from Councillor Toppelberg originally. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I believe that Councillor Loden is on point in respect to that. Okay. All right. Well, how about we go back and um, we will go back to the uh, item six in relation to the adoption of the minutes from the special council meeting on the 5th of July, 2022. Uh, may I have, do I need to get a decision that we will rescind the previous adopted minutes and then consider again? Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. We did have a motion uh, which was moved by, um, I believe, Councillor Hallett, seconded by Councillor uh, Castle, that the mo that, that the motion be uh, was moved. Uh, we just happened to go to a, a decision before the amendment was considered, so we can consider that that motion is back on the books, and that we move to the amendment. That would be probably the most effective way to deal. Okay, uh, is the mover and seconder happy with that approach? What, would the mover or seconder like to speak to the item? No. Councillor Apollo, I believe the floor is yours. Apologies for not making it clearer at the time that that would have been the appropriate time to move your amendment. Thank you. I, I got confused there because I thought someone did my amendment for me, which has happened in the past. Yeah. I'm a rookie, so we'll just Thank go you. with that. Okay. Um, so uh, I think it's the uh, proposed... Oh, do I need a... Do I need a um, you will need a seconder. Yes. I guess perhaps councillors, have you had time to read the amendment? Otherwise, Councillor Apollo, you could perhaps provide a brief overview. Okay. Do I need a seconder first? Generally, you would okay. just read okay, this roughly is a, what you're proposing this is a, so that they this can is a, consider it. Thank you. This is a, a, a motion to amend the, the minutes relating to the special council meeting of uh, 5 July. Just in relation to a request, I just wanted for the accuracy of the minutes, I wanted the um, my request during the meeting for a, a deferment to consider some to get some additional information about capital expenditure from administration so that we would be in a better position to make an informed decision and the response to that just so just to put on the record to be so that the minutes are more accurate. Do I have a seconder for this amendment? Seconded by Councillor Alexander. Councillor Apollo, do you wish to speak to it? Just briefly. I mean, it's, it's all here on the yellow. Um, so it's just uh, blue. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Thank you. On the blue. So just really two reasons. Uh, one, for the accuracy of the minutes. And two, just so that if, you know, from a learning perspective, if, if for anything else, uh, if that circumstance had occurred at some, sometime in the future, that, you know, from all people present from the councillor's perspective, from administration who may have wanted to comment but didn't, and from the presiding member, just from a learning perspective so that we would all be a bit more clearer about what the position should be. I think if it, this was reflected in the minutes, then we would be, we're raising awareness to the issue for, for should it happen again. Councillor Alexander. Uh, thank you, Acting Mayor. Um, look, I think part of the issue was that uh, there was seemed to be some confusion about uh, how long there was to be able to investigate things about the budget. And when Councillor Opolo asked a question um, uh, about a deferral, he was denied a deferral because the presiding... Uh, a person at the time said there wouldn't be enough um, time to be able to do that and do the advertising and all those sorts of things. And I certainly was near, I, I presume then it just meant that that time was the 31st of July. And then later we discovered it was actually the 31st of August. So it just seemed a bit um, strange that, you know, you know, that people here are expert in um, you know, particularly from the administration of 
you know, that the budget needed to be sorted by the 31st of August, and there's nearly two months to do that. Just a bit surprised that someone didn't didn't follow up on that that information. That was all. So there would have been the opportunity to have deferred the budget and get some of the information, which then enabled um, people to have full information of what was possible and what wasn't and what was intended. Um, with an, and I know you can call a meeting in two or three days, so it wouldn't have been a problem to, to have done that. So, you know, the deferral, I think, was um, rejected perhaps in error with the thought that perhaps the, the budget had to be done by the 31st of July. But as I said, there was nearly two months to, to sort the budget, so. Councillor Lowden. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just to query to understand, this is, I'm just trying to figure out where this sits in the minutes. So this is designed to go into amendment three on page 19 of the amendment. I'm just unclear of the wording, I guess is probably my question of what is it, is the piece that's in italics, the mayor advised, da, 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 da. That's to be inserted at the end of amendment three or Okay. No, oh, sorry, page 21, sorry. I think it would be helpful if we could make sure that we direct our questions to administration um, in this instance, because we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I believe the question, um, uh, executive manager, relates to exactly where in the minutes this item would be placed. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, the placement of it would be... Um, before the recording of the vote for Amendment 3 and, an, and the inclusion would be uh, from uh, the note, Council Opera sought to remove a procedural notion, motion through to the end of the quote from the Mayor. Thank you. Council Loden. Thank you. Sorry, did you say before Amendment 3 or after? It's like, it's like a new section basically, is that right? Um, through the chair, it would be before the actual recording of the vote of, on the amendment because it occurred chronologically uh, during the debate on Amendment 3. Councillor Lowden, you're okay. Anything further? Councillor Wallace. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, look, I don't, I don't really support this amendment. I think it's really important to note that while some councillors may have disagreed with the mayor's statement, it wasn't the mayor's decision to refuse the deferral. That was a decision that was made collectively by council not to vote for that motion. Um, I thank admin for their lengthy response on the back. Um, I think the most important paragraph to me was the second last one. The minutes are intended to be a record of the collective decision-making of the relevant council or committee and as such, a request by a member to include particular comments by the member or by other members in the minutes of the meeting should be declined. Um, you, you know, these meetings are recorded. If anybody wants to see exactly what happened, they're free to on the internet. I, I don't think the minutes are an appropriate place to record comments such as these. Councillor Castle. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, look, I agree with the Councillor Wallace. I don't think it's necessary, and I thank administration's explanation of why um, we're not, we have never, and we're not required to record verbatim what has what is said in council meetings because that is a record of decision making. Um, as Councillor Wallace has said, we have a live stream that's freely available for people to see exactly what was said. That's part of the transparency um, measures that have been in place in the city of Vincent for an, a number of years. Um, and I don't think um, this type of clarification adds anything to the understanding of what happened at that meeting that is not already available. Um, so I don't see that it's necessary or that it um, furthers um, the operations of this council. Anything further? Um, I think that um, I understand the intent around um, seeking to formally record learnings, but I don't think that the minutes are the place to do that. I think that perhaps 
us having this discussion is a way for us to ensure that we reflect on those um, matters as they come up. Um, but I don't feel that the additional clarification is warranted in relation to the question that was asked around uh, a deferral in this instance. So I am not supportive of the amendment to the minutes. Councillor Opelow, the right of reply. Uh, this will close debate. Off you go. That's fine. I mean, I would be happy even with uh, what the, the important thing about the accuracy of the minutes was that a request was made and it was denied. And if if that needs to be an alternate motion, I'm happy to propose that if this one gets defeated. Otherwise, I think it's a, a matter for the um, Standards Commission then because I just think that not wanting to document something which is a, a, a reasonable request and put it in the minutes because that is what was said, doesn't have to be verbatim, means that I necessarily would have to escalate it just because I think that we don't want any perception of procedural um, bias or, um, you know, I think it's important to me at this point. So I'll, I'll have an alternate motion if it gets defeated. Okay, that closes debate. I'll put it. All those in favour for the proposed amendment to the minutes? Councillor Alexander and Councillor Arapolo voting for. All those against? I declare it lost. Councillor Arapolo. I'd like the council to consider an alternate motion simply to something to the effect that says. Um, so and, uh, you're putting forward a second sure, amendment? Yep. yep. Okay, if I can have a second to hear that. Oh, could you? Well, I think. Are oh, you under the you amendment? Would, I think that my understanding is that you're not proposing that council doesn't adopt the minutes, which would be the alternate motion to a motion to adopt. I believe that you would be seeking to amend the minutes in another manner. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Um, Without verbatim comments. Oh. Because that was a, the source of the objection. Okay. Um, so, yep, I'll allow it. Please put forward your amendment. Okay. Councillor Iopolo requested a deferment to receive additional information to resolve other councillors' questions about what items of capital expenditure should be deferred as part of the motion being proposed, and the presiding member um, declined that request. Do I have a second for that amendment? Councillor Loden. Councillor Arpolo. Nothing further, thank you. Councillor Loden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I understand the intent here. I guess what we're coming down to is interpretation on that conversation. So I was also in the chamber at the time and I agree that you asked about a deferment and I, I guess this comes down to the experience side of things and my interpretation of what was said at the time was that uh, Mekol was providing you a reason for why that was not a good idea in her role as a member of the council. So she expressing a view, that was my interpretation, but that's because I guess I know that if I wanted to move the procedural motion, she can't stop me sort of thing. Like that's my, my right as a council member sort of thing. So my interpretation of that was her view that she expressed was a, a, an opinion on an amendment on, on the deferral rather than um, her in her capacity as uh, the presiding member saying that you cannot move the amendment, but I also recognise that <laughs> that you've you've interpreted it as you were told you could not do that. I don't know what the wording is to explain that happening, basically, but it not it wasn't it's not the wording that you proposed in your amendment, but I understand it's it's basically something along the lines of saying that Councillor Iapolo uh, raised raised the potential to do a deferment. Um, Mayor Cole responded that it was, that we're, they effectively we're running out of time and that therefore it was going to cause a problem if you do that. Um, and no procedural motion was moved because there was lack of clarity around the role, all the feedback that was provided, if that was as your, as official capacity as a presiding member or as a member of the council. So I, I don't support the amendment, but that's kind of my take on events if that helps. Anything further? 
Jill, um, this was a really important amendment. This is the difference. The, the amendment was the difference between tax, uh, rate payers paying 7.6%, which was proposed by administration, and my alternate solution, which was 4.5%, simply by deferring capital expenditure of 1.4 million that could never be spent in a, in a fiscal calendar year, 21 million versus the most that we've ever spent is 9.5, thereby affecting uh, asking rate payers to pay something that we would never spend. I thought it was very important, Councillor Lode, and I was trying to address his question, and I took the presiding member's statements as fact because of the strong opinion she gave, and I thought it would be important in the minutes, but if, and I think it's a really important point, but I'll, uh, that's what I have to say on the matter for now. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Apollo. I'll speak to it. Um, look, uh, my in views accord with Councillor Lodens in relation to the fact that there was a question asked in the chamber, there was not a vote taken as a procedural motion wasn't put. I do appreciate that it can be challenging to get across standing orders. However, the standing orders are clear that there's no debate on procedural motions. So if a procedural motion is put, then the vote is considered. Asking a question about a, uh, an item that is up for discussion um, is not recorded in the minutes. So we don't, our minutes don't record all of the questions that we ask through the, the course of a, a debate. They don't record them verbatim. Um, and as such, um, we, we keep our minutes fairly trim to the motions that were considered and who voted, noting that there is, of course, the uh, recording of the live stream. So in this circumstance, whilst I do appreciate that for new councillors it can be a challenge to come up to speed with standing orders, I don't believe that a vote um, was taken on this item. And so therefore, in order to have a vote taken, we had to have a, um, a, a motion that was formally put. I would also like to, to just say that whilst I do um, understand that Councillor Apollo is very, you're very passionate about this, I do think that it is also important to consider that um, uh, we, because there was a vote, it wasn't a vote put, we actually don't know um, whether there was support or otherwise for such a, you know, and then the, the uh, actions that may have come out of it. So I um, appreciate that you felt that, that um, you have a different interpretation of events um, and that consider that maybe that we would have gone down a different pathway had we, we um, had that item been put and formally considered, but I don't believe that that was the case. And um, as Councillor Alexander said, there was a question asked. Um, and so I think in this instance, um, that's not how we record things in our minutes. Um, so I'm not supportive of the amendment in this instance. Uh, any other speakers haven't spoken? No, I'll put it. All those in favour of the amendment? Councillor Alexander and Councillor Opulo. All those against? I declare it lost. And we're now back to the substantive. Are there any further speakers in relation to the adoption of the minutes for the special council meeting on the 5th of July, 2022? No, I will now put it. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Alexander and Councillor Iopolo voting against. Okay, so we will now, having dealt with the items on block, we will now go to the items in the order that they were called out by members of the public gallery. The first one being item 9.7, Beaufort Street and Grosvenor Road pedestrian improvement projects. May I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Council, uh, noting Councillor Warner is uh, departing the chamber. Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Wallace. Councillor Loden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, just to raise the questions from the gallery, the first one was just around the, the impact on uh, Chelmsford Road. Um, and and so that, that is because people will be accessing that out through the, the laneway. Is that correct? And did we look at the issues of traffic volume? Have I got, you look confused, Director. No, okay. <laughs> I thought the question was Chelmsford Road. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. So that there is cars accessing out through Chelmsford Road, and there was concern raised about a lack of consultation with members, uh, people living on that street. Um, did did we look at volume of traffic? Or have an idea of what the likelihood of traffic volume is going to be through that street and consequences for that? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I can answer, I guess, those two elements. The traffic counts were completed from the 9th to the 16th of December 2021 on Raglan, Chelmsford and Grosvenor Roads, um, which was considered that peak period, um, and it was not considered that um, they were um, very busy routes at that point. Uh, we will be doing, if this is approved, we will be doing further uh, data collection to determine uh, the changes to those traffic counts to understand how the traffic has changed and if that does create that congestion. In regards to the question regarding the community engagement um, for ahead of uh, tonight's council meeting, uh, there was um, engagement with all of the adjacent businesses regarding the Grosvenor Road trial. There was also a um, web page on the Imagine Vincent website uh, from the 9th of May. Uh, this advertised the details of the proposed trial and outlined two community drop-in sessions, which were held at the Elford on the 1st of June and St Albans Anglican Church on the 7th of June. The community were notified of these sessions through a variety of methods, including letters to property owners, residents and businesses within a 400 metre catchment of the trial area. Um, we also corresponded with the City of Stirling as it's so close to that border. Um, project information was published on the city's social media and postcards were distributed to businesses in the town centre and uh, were available at the city's administration centre. Thank you. And so to go back to the specific uh, query around traffic volume, so my, just so I'm clear about this in my head, by blocking off that road from Grosvenor Street, people are not going to be able to go out there and hang a left or turn in through that street. And so instead, uh, people in that car park and the residents in that area will be uh, leaving the area prim probably primarily through Raglan Road, but there is also a concern that there's a laneway that I can't see the name of that connects Grosvenor and Chelmsford, so there will be some people that go out through that way. Uh, but from administration's perspective, because the volume of traffic is low, you don't see that, that is going to significantly in impact Chelmsford Street. Is that correct? Through you, Deputy Mayor, um, that is uh, what we are perceiving, but we will definitely have to collect data in order to measure that. Um, just to confirm that you will be able to turn from both its street into Grosvenor during the trial shared street period, which will occur from the 17th of October to the 14th of November for four weeks. The pedestrian street where that would be complete is proposed to be completely closed is proposed from the 1st to the 16th of October which is a total of 16 days. Thank you. Um, a concern was also raised around the, the quantum of money being spent. Uh, and my understanding is that a lot of these pieces of uh, furniture and so forth can be utilised elsewhere if the trial does not proceed further. Uh, are you able just to advise what the split is of, I guess, costs that are incurred just on the street, that the road that we cannot remove or move somewhere else and what are the components that could be moved elsewhere? Through you, Deputy Mayor, absolutely. For the trial itself, um, there is a, the cost is $43,000. That split is uh, $20,000 for that street furniture and amenity that could be repurposed, noting that $1,000 of that is grant funding. Um, $5,000 of that is the installation of that um, street furniture. So obviously that's more of a resource cost um, and would not be able to be repurposed as is with the activations and events as they are location specific at $16,000 with $5,000 of that being RAC grant funded. And then we also have a contingency of $2,000. Uh, the Grosvenor Road footpath upgrade, which is um, the change to the road condition is what is valued at $70,000. Uh, $70,697, uh, 31,000 of that is RAC funded. And just noting that that Grosvenor Road footpath upgrade um, 
if the trial was not to go ahead or if there was no closure to the road whatsoever, that would still allow for traffic both ways. So the $70,697 does not impact traffic going uh, either way on that road. It is the $43,000 for the cost of the trial. Thank you. Uh, further query was raised around collecting data from businesses. And as part of, if this trial is to proceed, will uh, what will the consultation that occurs with businesses, will we obtain data off the businesses in that precinct as part of the trial? Through you, Deputy Mayor, absolutely. We will um, continue to engage with businesses throughout the trial and following. We would ask businesses to share with us as much information as they possibly can about the impacts on their business. It would obviously be up to them on um, how much they wanted to share with the city as they're not bound to share, um, obviously, a lot of information with us. So I guess from my perspective, I'm I'm supportive of this. the officer's recommendation. I note the feedback from the... Uh, the community on this that has come to the chamber tonight. Um, but in my mind, this is a trial and this is, I, know, I, I appreciate that there will be consequences from this, but I think it's a useful activity to undertake. I think there is value and we can make, if we can make this successful. We have a hell of a lot of roads in the city of Vincent and very few uh, places where pedestrians are given a priority. This is an opportunity to potentially create that space in our community. That is driven by our, our strategy, our accessible city strategy that sort of drives this to make pedestrians a priority on our streets rather than cars. I actually like the maturity of this proposal as well. It doesn't just say we're going to close off the street and that's it. We close off the street and see how that works. We collect a lot of data. We also then go a, a halfway step there, which allows traffic to go one way out of the street, but closes off part of the street to, to so you're allowed to come in through into the road, but you aren't able to exit. And because of the configuration of um, the roads and the, the um, barrier on Beaufort Street, there is, it is only currently uh, an in and an out on going one way. So by having to go out to Raglan Street, you're not actually vastly increasing the distance that someone will drive. In fact, I'm not convinced that it actually increased the distance and created a barrier for people accessing this site at all. We will see from the trial though, um, and, and that's kind of the point. Uh, so we trial this, we use temporary things, we use low cost items, we've got grants from RAC to support this, and we're also using equipment that if this is not successful in many parts, we can go and take that somewhere else. I'm hopeful that this is successful and that we see improved utilisation of that space and that we can do this pedestrian space, because I think that would be, be a good outcome for pedestrians, which is something we desire, but we are intentionally being data driven about this. So we will see what the results are. And when that comes back to council again for consideration, we will consider those matters further. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Luden. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, there's a comment uh, that a primary concern with this proposal was the loss of car bays. Um, I was just wondering what admin's plans were, were this to become like a permanent uh, fixture um, for the section of Grosvenor Street that's a little bit further west of where this proposal currently ends, um, like right up until where the residential properties begin. Like to me, it seems like a, a quite large and underutilized piece of bitumen um, that potentially could accommodate a few more car parking bays if we were to take the route of permanently reconfiguring this area. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, we haven't made any plans for what the future would look like um, following this trial as we would be really just gathering the data uh, gathering, we would be doing a lot of community engagement throughout the trial to understand what those possibilities are. Um, again, those traffic sensors to understand uh, if there has been a lot of loss of access to the area. So we haven't made any decisions or plans uh, beyond the trial. We would be using all of the data that is collected throughout the trial to make that uh, comment. But I guess the loss of the 15 minute bays and the loading zone and the motorcycle bay it's been temporarily located on Grosvenor Road, 20 metres away from the, um, 20 metres away during the works and the trial. So we would be able to collect that data to if that relocation was successful or if that also had negative impacts on that area as well. Um, the, the trial seems kind of short to me. Is, are you confident you're going to be able to collect the data that you need and kind of like map changes in visitor habits over, over a, you know, two week and, in four or six week trial? Through you, Deputy Mayor, we specifically uh, included the date so that 
it included three weekends and school holidays for that um, pedestrian street where it is uh, fully closed in order for us to enable kind of different situations and for us to collect that data and the most people using the space. Uh, it will definitely be a focus of the team to get that engagement and be out there throughout that time if this is approved. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm generally supportive of this proposal. I think I concur with a lot of what Councillor Loden said. Um, you know, like a lot of our town centres struggle with the same problem, which is balancing community hopes for walkability and green space with major transit corridors running right through the middle of them. And I think Beaufort Street, probably the worst example of that. Um, so an opportunity like this, which to me superficially seems somewhat low impact um, to introduce some green space and something that's a little bit more habitable for people that aren't in vehicles um, is a great opportunity. So yeah, I, I support this one. Look forward to seeing the results if it passes. Thank you. Councillors? Councillor Alexander? Um, I'd like to uh, say I'm pretty much implacably opposed to this uh, um, venture, and I'd be interested to know who dreamed it up. And um, Councillor or Deputy Mayor Konachewski and I went and had a look and formed our uh, own opinions. And I can say um, we've got a couple of emails from Dean Schultz and uh, Sean Offer, who are business people there, the chemist and uh, the local uh, fresh provisions. And also I might add that uh, the chemist there, Dean Schultz, actually knew my dear departed father because the Alexanders know this area very, very well for, for many, many years. And this is bordering on insanity, in my view, because what you're asking people to do, and... If you, you see Sean Offer's uh, email with regards to the consultation and what he believed was the lack of authenticity in it, um, and Dean Schultz mentioning that there was one single day when he read the report that there were observations on, on traffic movements. Now, what we're looking at, if you know the area, the car parks are behind Beaufort Street, um, one between Chompsford Road and Grosvenor Road, one between Grosvenor Road and Raglan and Walcott Street. So what we're asking people to do is navigate, not just out of Thompson Road and Raglan Road, but navigate through car parks. Now, seriously, um, Dean Schultz in his letter actually observes that one of the dangers is going to be people on foot. And he's concerned for his customers, his family, and ratepayers of the city of Vincent. Now, I don't say it lightly or emotively to say, I think this is bordering on insanity, but you're going to be putting people at risk. It's fine to have a woke idea about, you know, let's close off, you know, Grosvenor Road and, you know, we'll have festivals there and all that sort of thing. Um, in Sean Offer's uh, email, he opens up with, this access into the, is, is the heart of the Mount Lawley parking and it's a critical access way for clients to turn in and utilise the car parks. Now, this is a man that's there every day and observing what goes on every day. If you go there, you will see their busy car parks and actually, as it is now, you've got to be a little careful walking through the car parks. So, you know, let, let me just quote, you know, from a, a couple of the emails and then also later on I have a suggested amendment which, you know, perhaps you might, uh, you might consider. But... The, the local chemist, Dean Schultz, talks about the safety of customers in car park. He said, the car park behind us is already dangerous. And at certain times, uh, due to the nature of turns, the car park, it's exacerbated when delivery vehicles are involved. And when there's only one usable exit from the car park, uh, that's the northern one becoming Raglan Road. And for those that know that exit, you go into Raglan Road, and then immediately you have to do a left-hand turn to go into Walcott Street. And cars back up, three or four cars, and they're backed up from Walcott Street through to the exit from the car park. Um, this becoming um, two exits instead of three is going to exacerbate that. And so, as Dean Schultz mentions, when people become impatient, they become a little bit reckless. So... You know, I really don't think this traffic study has been very well thought through at all. And I think, you know, it's a great concern about the congestion and what's going to uh, um, happen. He also mentions that 
and I think I, I said this, that a single day of observation is hardly the basis for making a decision on this matter. And every business owner will tell you that not every day is the same. You have quiet days and you have busy days. He suspects that there was a good chance this was on a quiet trade day. So he's particularly concerned about those sorts of things. And Sean Offer, who is one of the owners and principals of Fresh Provisions, which is on the car park between um, Grosvenor Road and Raglan Road and, and Walcott Street, um, you know, he, he's concerned that Grove, and mentions that Grosvenor Road approach to my business and the other businesses in this, in this area is vitally important. Now, these are businessmen that understand what drives their business. And in the, in the email here, he talks about the concerns that if Grosvenor, Grosvenor is closed, some people going up Beaufort Street and that will continue on to other districts to, to, uh, to find somewhere to shop. Councillor Alexander, I'm advised that you've reached your five minutes. So if you could make your concluding remarks or seek my, approval to okay. go beyond. My, my concluding marks, remarks before I get the opportunity to pass the amendment is that it's already a very, very busy car park with, with three exits. Uh, you know, I'd suggest to councillors that they drive over, um, you know, on a Thursday afternoon or somewhere and try it and find a parking spot and navigate your, your way out of the car, the car park, down to Chomsford Road, turn left, and then try and make a right-hand turn. Good luck with that. Um, so as one of the business owners says, this is creating a, a very dangerous precinct. And I, I just would encourage councillors to go and have a, have a look for themselves. But it's an ill-advised... Um, Council I, Alexander, are you moving your amendment or...? No, I'll wait for other people to finish okay. and I would like to move the amendment then. Okay, I'll Thank get you. back to you. Back to Councillor you. Alpelo. Um, yeah, this is an interesting, interesting one um, and I do have some concerns about it. Look, I'm all for pedestrianising streets, um, but just about where the right streets are, you know, to do it because if it, this is seems to be adversely affecting car park access to the area. So, you know, walking streets are great for people who live within walking distance of our, our um, community centres, our urban centres, but to the extent that we might make changes that adversely affect the businesses and their trading, uh, it, whether it be a trial or not, um, you know, we need the business. The reason why people go there and want to walk on these streets is because of the businesses that exist there. It's the cafes, the dining experiences, the shops. And so we don't want what we don't want to do if we pick the wrong spot for these types of trials is to disencourage people from actually going to the areas. And I guess that's where my concerns lay, not, not so much in the concept of, um, you know, uh, walking streets, but the, the actual location here. Um, we've heard from, you know, potential, some businesses who feel they would be adversely affected by the trial who are here. I thank them for attending. Um, yeah, so that is my concern. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors? Okay, I will speak to it briefly. Um, look, I've heard from the uh, members of the public gallery this evening. I've had some correspondence with them and, and other councillors this evening. Um, I, I am supportive of this. Uh, I ultimately um, think that this is the predominant expenditure here relates to a capital works improvement to the footpath along Beaufort Street. That's the $70,000. Um, capital works costs a lot of money. That's footpaths cost a lot of money. I, I think that that's completely reasonable. It's in line with our accessible city strategy. And um, I think that it uh, will make a, uh, a positive contribution to both those people who are walking, riding, the people that are catching the high frequency buses um, along Beaufort Street. Um, there is, uh, then there is the trial. I think that part of the challenge that we've had here is because of a desire to perhaps, you know, save, um, achieve some economies, the capital works component and the road closure associated with that has then been bundled in with this trial. And perhaps that's a learning for us in, in relation to this. Uh, but I am supportive of the capital works project. 
In terms of the trial, uh, I think, look, I, I don't believe that it is um, insanity to implement council's strategies and plans. That's ultimately uh, what we're doing here. I don't believe that it is inappropriate to undertake a trial before permanent infrastructure works are implemented that allows us to assess impact in practice. I don't believe that it is um, anything other than core council business to improve our capital works in our town centres. And I do think that the program of events that are proposed uh, are suitable, um, sound, actually sound like a lot of fun. Um, and I think overall, uh, those events should draw people to the town centre whilst we're undertaking this trial. That's what they're designed to do. We're not, you know, the intention is not to undertake a trial that will um, have a uniformly negative impact. Um, so I've asked questions last week in relation to access for commercial vehicles and I've received a response and I'm satisfied with that. I ultimately, I do take on board the comments in relation to the, um, the navigation of the car parks. As a Highgate and Matt Lawley resident for 44 years now, I can assure you that I walk and drive there. I drive there way too frequently, but I do walk there very regularly as well. So I know those car parks well. Um, and I, uh, I think that we're ultimately looking to make a, um, an improvement in the pedestrian experience for, to improve safety and accessibility and amenity for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, which is completely in line with our accessible city strategy. We will assess impact in relation to the car parks and we can go forward from there. I do appreciate the note that the expenditure in relation to the furniture can be reused elsewhere if this doesn't go ahead and also appreciate the administration in seeking out grant funding so that there is a contribution from an external funder. I think that this is ultimately a good project. I think that we still have some growing to do in relation to how we go about implementing activities when we have put them in approved plans. But I will also assure members of the public gallery that when we consult on our accessible city strategies, when we consult on our town centre place plans, these are the uh, key documents that drive the delivery of um, services and actions that, um, that follow them. So um, I'm confident um, that this proposal is in line with those approved documents. Um, so I'm supportive of this uh, item before us this evening. Does the mover wish to have a right of reply? No, Councillor Loden. All right, then I will go to Councillor Alexander for your amendment. Councillor Alexander, you have already spoken. So just procedurally, you need to move your amendment, get a seconder, and then you can speak to that amendment. Good suggestion. Okay, I will read it out. One, many business people have not been consulted adequately and their grave concerns for the access of their clients and their safety has been subsequently underestimated. Two, several businesses have major concerns on the likely negative impact their businesses and their livelihoods that this proposal will have. Please see in particular, you know, Mr. Sean Offers and Dean Schultz's emails. Councillor Alexander, what is your amendment seeking to do? My amendment is... Oh, I believe that there's some words have been, been, have been prepared that may assist? Uh, yes, I sent these these off this afternoon. Uh, to you, we could put those words on the screen. I think Wendy has them to share screen. We um, put the requested amendment from Councillor Alexander into a form of a motion. Well, that's okay. Been, so, been... so what needs to happen is that we need to have a motion that you're putting before us, that an amending motion. So I believe that there'll be some uh, a draft put on the screen. You can confirm if you're satisfied with that and then councillors can read it and, and you can seek a seconder. 
I can, I can read three, it out three, now. Three, like. uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I, I can read out uh, uh, what we suggest in terms of putting into a amendment form uh, that Council one defers consideration of item 9.7 for the purpose of clarity around consultation and further advice in respect to the worth and effectiveness of the project. And two, request the CEO to meet with Mr. Offer and Mr. Schultz to discuss their experience in respect to consultation on the proposed project and their concerns regarding the project impacts. Can I just, may I just ask a procedural question? If a deferral, that's that's then a deferral motion? So it's a, that's then, a, I guess, a procedural motion as opposed to an amendment? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, the second, um, uh, the second item is not procedural. It's requesting uh, that the CEO meets with Mr. Offer and Mr. Schultz. Yes, yeah, so my question relates to how we can have a procedural motion and a non-procedural motion in the same motion, given that one is subject to debate and one isn't. So, um, Councillor Alexander, if my understanding from these words is that you're seeking to have Council defer consideration of this item for further consultation, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so then in that instance, what you would do, and this is learnings again, is that you would need to um, request that, like, put a procedural motion. So um, can I confirm that you wish to put forward a motion of deferral for this item? Yes, okay. Can I have a seconder for, the, is there a seconder for this motion? Seconded by Councillor Iopolo. Being a procedural motion, there is no debate. So I would put the motion to defer the consideration of this item to enable for further consultation to be undertaken and for the CEO or administration to meet with Mr. Offer and Mr. Schultz in relation to their submissions. Would that be fair wording, Councillor Alexander? It might be worth putting an A and a B because I suspect one will be no and one will be yes. Um, the, as a, the deferral motion is just a deferral. Okay. So I guess I'm sort of um, putting in the reasons for the deferral, if they're acceptable to you. Yes. Um, okay, let's put that and then we can go forward. Um, I'll put the matter, all those in favour of deferral. And all those against. Councillor Loden, Councillor Castle, Councillor Wallace, Councillor Hallett, myself voting against, I declare it lost. Councillor Alexander, do you wish to put forward an amendment to the substantive motion in relation to um, requesting additional meetings or anything of that nature? Just give me a moment. Well, not really, because the CO can determine whether he wants to meet with people or not. Okay. In the the CEO has advised that he will he will be meeting he will um, offer a meeting to Mr. Schultz, Mr. Offer, in relation to this item. I will go back to Councillor Loden as the mover of the substantive motion. He does not wish to exercise his right of reply. As such, I will put the motion. All those in favour. All those against. Councillor Alexander and Councillor Iopolo voting against. I declare it carried. Can someone please alert Councillor Warner? The next item on the agenda is item 9.3, character areas and heritage areas, outcomes of advertising guidelines for Wilberforce and Kalgoorlie streets in Mount Hawthorne. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Noting, noting Councillor Castle is leaving the chamber due to her uh, proximity interest. Moved by Councillor Loden, seconded by Councillor Warner. Councillor Loden. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just a couple of queries on this one. The first one was just around um, the number of support, uh, people supporting and against this amendment. So the comment from the gallery was that there was six support and nine against because there was a number of emails that were double counted in some way. I was wondering if I could get a comment back from administration around the validity of that, I guess, or, or what, what administration's view is firstly. Through you, Deputy Mayor, yes, there was a total of 48 individual submissions received. Of the 48 submissions, five were through both a survey and email, 
and two properties submitted responses from both land owners. 11 of the 48 submissions were received from people outside of the character areas. Um, so in summary, there is 11 of the 23 responses that we received through email and survey of support and 12 of objection. However, of those 11, some of them are from the same, like people have put in two submissions effectively. Is that like, if, if, I, if I was to tally this up against households, are there 23 households that responded of which 11 said they supported and 12 said no? Or is there a smaller number of households that don't, that, that are supportive or unsupportive? Through you, Deputy Mayor, there is one household that received responses from both landowners. They we re, we noted those as two separate responses or people. So I suppose that that is one less household. Um, and I will have to refer to the attachment to have a look at the email responses. One minute. Through you, Deputy Mayor, while the manager's um, seeing if we can clarify that, which is probably um, a bit complicated, uh, you've got it. I just, I, I just might add that um, the, this isn't a vote on the number of objections or um, those in favour. There's no doubt that there's a split and there's some in favour, some against. And the key to all of this from administration's perspective um, was to address the concerns that were raised. So we attempted to address those concerns. We removed a number of the provisions um, that were proposed to, to change what's in the R codes and our built form policy. Um, and to address those comments that came out of the community feedback and to try and create a middle ground where we thought the majority, the vast majority of the community would be comfortable with um, the provisions that were included. So the provisions that are included now just relate to the ground floor setback, um, which is the average of the two properties either side. Um, currently it's the five properties either side. So um, it's more nuanced for this street. Um, carports and garages, uh, garage width to be 5.5 metres. Um, ordinarily it's 50% of the width of the property. Measuring these properties and the average width 5.5 metres was, it's more specific. Um, so that is an additional standard that's been applied um, and a 2.7 metre high garage. Um, again, looking at the average height of those garages and what would be appropriate and workable on those properties. Um, in a standard stating that new dwellings should be, um, uh, should match the style, scale and form of the existing dwellings in the street. Um, floor levels should match the neighbouring properties and upper storey windows should match the original dwelling. So, so that's the extent of the provisions that are proposed now. Um, a number of provisions were removed that in the advertised version were removed. So the upper floor street setback was removed. Uh, loft addition requirements standards were removed. Street surveillance, uh, the fencing standards were removed. Uh, roof pitch and window style standards were all removed. Thank Through you, you Deputy Mayor, sorry, just following on, uh, no, we do not have the survey responses of those properties uh, in the survey. They did not list the, have to list their property number there. Thank you. Look, I, I broadly am supportive of this. I'll, I'll listen to the debate and I'm, I'm interested to hear what other council members have to say about this, but I do agree with the director's points. This, uh, I, I don't think I'd be comfortable adopting this as it was advertised. Um, but a lot of the commentary that come, has come back uh, has been addressed. I mean, the, it's the, a lot of the, the so-called teeth around this has been removed, particularly the, uh, the upper story restriction, um, I think is a big one. And that leads to a lot of what I think a lot of people were concerned about. I don't see that these provisions are overly onerous on people. I think you will still be very easily able to develop your house, to add extensions to it, to do what you need to do. In my mind, what this does effectively is 
make sure that there's some tie to the, a stronger tie to the context of your street. So you do need to be closely, more closely aligned with where your setback is to, compared to your neighbours. If you have a neighbour five doors down that's really long way forward, that will then give you a lot more space you can move forward. But similarly, if there's somebody a really long way back, they'll actually draw you back. So there will actually ironically be winners and losers in that regard, but I don't see that as being particularly significant. The provisions around um, a carport, a five metre wide carport is more than adequate to fit two cars in. Um, so I don't see that that's going to stop people from putting in a, a carport into their place. Um, and then the other aspects of really aesthetic things that are about making sure that what you're looking at is tying in with that streetscape, which I think is a good thing. I think that's what our community is asking for us. Um, so I will listen to the debate, but from my perspective, I'm supportive of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Loden. Councillor Warner. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the character area under the policy is a collection of houses, streets or parts of a suburb that contain built form characteristics valued by the community. The intention behind the amendment to the character areas and heritage policy for Wilberforce and Calgary streets was and is a noble one, one that is community led with the endeavour to enable sustainable development outcomes in the future by encouraging retention and renovation of character. Um, however, whilst 52% of landowners on Wilberforce Street initially supported the policy, the support seems to have diminished and the consultation with the residents has identified three main reasons, um, saying that the provisions are too strict, they're unsure of what they're signing up for exactly, and potential loss in property values. And whilst administration has recommended amendments to the policy based on this feedback, I believe this is really well intentioned and quite constructive, but I can't overlook the fact that this has divided a once unified neighbourhood. And one thing that I value very highly as a councillor is nourishing our communities. And to have an issue that threatens to split a street almost in half is not what we we're aspiring to. Um, even if technically it meets the, the numbers that we want to get on this, I, I, it's just not, it's not in the spirit of what, what was intended for this. So I do not support the recommendation to proceed with the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Just a question to administration through you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on the suggestion to go back out to consult further. There was um, a comment from the public gallery that the revisions weren't, I guess, revisited with the community and um, there's still some concern that perhaps not everyone's aware of what is being proposed. And I feel like there's a bit of a a view within administration that it is it's minor and it um it won't restrict development and then from some community members that it is still too restrictive and just wondering if would further consultation or, or communication be helpful through you deputy mayor there was significant consultation done through the period uh just to summarize there was a, a community forum held initially the uh, residents then requested that there was an additional meeting which the city, uh, which administration organised an on-street information session, along with the regular website information and a survey. The questions for the survey um, out, asked people about their overall support and also had comments on the specific provisions. It was not just a general survey and asked if there were any other additional information that was required. Following the changes to the guidelines, uh, these guidelines were sent to all submitters on the 14th of July. Um, following that, we received three concerns regarding the, um, the changes to the guidelines showing that there was not support even for the changed guidelines. We did not receive any other um, feedback. So I feel that in this case, we have received all of the engagement um, and feedback on this matter at, at this time. Councillor Hallett, no. Councillor Upler. Thank you. Um, generally, I'm actually supportive of heritage areas, but um, I just wanted some questions to administration on this. My understanding of the policy is that um, designation of a heritage precinct can either be community led or it can be done through that heritage council or um, those types of avenues. I, I presume that this precinct and this is a question is different to a Brookman Moyer in a sense that that is one UNESCO awards 
It's on the State Heritage Council list. Uh, is very unique in Australia and not just Australia, but in the world. Um, so in relation to this area, are we, I just want confirmation that it is indeed community led and, and maybe you could just talk to what the, there wasn't a lot of technical aspects in the brief talking about why this area should be heritage listed or designated as a heritage precinct. If it's coming down to community community led stuff, I do worry about the 50-50 split. So if you can just give me um, some background around that and particularly in comparison to Brookman Moyer and what the restrictions on building would be in this precinct versus a Brookman Moyer type situation. Yes, yeah, certainly um, through your deputy mayor. So there are two different designations that the city applies to different areas. Um, one is a heritage area and one is a character area. Um, the history of that goes really goes back to when um, the state, again, the state government changed regulations uh, in 2015 to um, exempt the demolition of single houses. So if you wanted to demolish your house, you didn't need to get planning approval for that anymore. And at that time, they, they um, promoted the option of listing areas as heritage areas which if you're in a heritage area, you need approval to, de to demolish. And there's, there's a policy around that that guides that demolition requirements. Um, at the same time, the city of Vincent was looking at um, areas that they didn't want to impose heritage requirements on and restrict or um, you know, make it difficult to demolish. And so um, council created the, the character um, retention policy it was called at the time. Um, so this area is proposed to be a character area. So there's no restrictions around demolition. Um, there's no restrictions around um, development. It is simply uh, a, an area that has been considered to have character or a particular feel and, and um, uh, a design that um, provisions have been put together so that, that those um, design elements are considered as part of the development assessment. So that's what's being proposed for this area. So it's not a heritage area. It's not proposing to restrict um, demolition or development other than to say there are some specific elements that should be considered. Um, so that's kind of the history of it. Uh, in relation to the, the numbers and the community-led aspect, the policy that council put, put together all those years ago around character um, was set up so that if there was 40% of the community signed a petition proposing a character area for their street, then the council would consider it. That doesn't mean that it would happen. It did, didn't mean that it, it doesn't mean that, um, it, all it would mean was council would consider it and decide whether to advertise that to the broader street or not. Um, and that's really the extent of it. And then from there, a decision's made. It's not um, that 40% doesn't need to be maintained. It's just the trigger for the administration to do the work to assess the street and, and have council consider the decision. Um, there's a 70% number in the, in the policy as well around revocation, which is the same thing. And that was to avoid situations where you had 40% supporting initiating it. And then it, people just kept writing. Uh, the other 40% would come in to have it revoked. So it was an attempt to try and stop um, a back and forth on the issue and for it to be put to rest once the decision was made by council. So it's just really the trigger for council to consider it. So just clarify, was it community-led, this one? Did, this is that's coming correct. from the 40% petition? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and, and, and you're saying that the, the restrictions on building in this area is nowhere near like a Moya Brookman, is that... Yeah, they're, they're completely different things. Yeah, yeah. Brooklyn Moy, you can't demolish your house without approval. Um, and there are very strong requirements around everything you do. Um, that's not, it's, there's nothing like this. This is this really, it's the same as a lot of the, the rest of the city. The provisions are the same, um, except for there's some minor um, amendments have been made to some of the standards. It's, it's not introducing new standards or additional things. It's just changing the existing standards that exist under the R codes and the built form policy across the city. And, and lastly, given that it is essentially community led and given that we've shown, you know, from the consultation and for even from the remarks around the room that this is a, really a split, like it's, a, you know, it's, split, it's splitting the neighbourhood in terms of people that are, are more pro-character versus um, 
what's my restriction to development. Is that a is that not a concern for administration if where where it is so uh, split down the middle? Because as a councillor trying to decide on this, I'm split down the middle too. Like I, I want what the community wants, and if the community's not clear about it, I'm I'm hesitant to to support something where fifty percent whether it's 40 or 60 or 50 or 50, whatever, but where it's pretty much down the line, I, I'm more going to err on no change than change um, if I if it's supposed to be a community-led proposal effectively. Yes, through you, through you, Deputy Mayor, it certainly is a concern for administration. We attempted to try and find a middle ground where um, we could address the concerns that were raised, but this is council's policy and, um, you know, it's completely up to council to decide whether it's appropriate to proceed or not. I do want to remark that I, I am want to congratulate administration for doing that subsequent consultation, given the where it was sitting. And I think that that is really important. And I think that, you know, I, I want to thank you for doing that. Um, um, yeah. Mark. Thank you, Councillor Apollo. Councillors, Councillor Wallace. Sorry, I just had a question for admin. If they could confirm whether within these precincts, if you'd have put forward a development application, the applicant is still free to request deviations from these guidelines as they are with other design codes and local policies. Is that correct? Yes, through your Deputy Mayor, it's exactly the same process as a development application currently in that street. Um, yeah, so exactly the same process. That's great. Um, look, I think I'm generally supportive um, as Administration and Council Lloyd and outlined. I think what's actually being proposed here in Wilberforce is quite weak. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I guess I just suggest to other councillors if they were considering um, voting against this item uh, because of the Wilberforce item, that it potentially an amendment would be better to remove that from the substantive motion rather than denying the others, which I think is somewhat less controversial and generally supported. Anything further? I'll speak to it. Um, look, I think that um, whilst uh, I've heard from Marie and from, from other uh, residents that um, what's observed currently on the street is that the people that live there do value um, the character of their street and have to date redeveloped sensitively. Um, the idea behind the character policy is to ensure that new development will be sympathetic to the unique character of the streetscape and to establish some provisions that are unique to that street that will guide that development. Um, noting, of course, that there are always, you know, uh, two pathways towards a development approval. So I think ultimately that we can't guarantee that the people that live in a street now are the people that are going to live in a street tomorrow and that what we need to do is we need to look at streets that we've identified and that the community has identified as having high character attributes, undertake an assessment to determine if that, that is confirmed from a technical perspective and that's been undertaken, to work with the community to uh, further develop those specific attributes that are considered to contribute to the unique character of the streetscape and develop a local policy. Um, I think that uh, that policy has been developed. It has been amended in response to consultation. It is uh, a fairly, fairly benign, um, but it seems to me that what we come down to is whether individual streets should have um, a character designation or not across the board, rather than the specific provisions in the policy before us. I am supportive of the city having a character policy. I think this street is worthy of some additional um, or more specific planning provisions. And so I'm supportive of the recommendation from administration. I do note that I think that the intent behind the community-led policy is um, proving problematic in that we do seem to have this situation every time where by having the thresholds in our policy for the allocation of resources towards the consideration of character, it then leads um, 
has led to a community perception that this is ultimately a, a vote. Um, council has to consider the results of a consultation, the substantive issues raised, the technical input that we are provided, a raft of other policies, and also we need to make decisions for the good of the district as a whole, even when we're making decisions in, that will ultimately affect, what, you know, primarily affect one segment of it. And I do know that the city of Vincent as a whole values heritage and values character. And um, we, I, I am asked about that. It is part of our strategic community plan. And I believe that it's also been raised in our review of the strategic community plan. Um, so I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, so whilst I acknowledge this has been divisive on Wilberforce Street and I, that, you know, um, is, is really concerning, uh, I do think that the street is worthy of having a local planning um, instrument that will ensure or provide some additional um, clarification of what sort of development would be considered to be sympathetic to the unique character of the streetscape. And as such, I'm supportive of the recommendation. Councillor Loden, would you like a right of reply? No? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Warner and Councillor Iopolo voting against, I declare it carried. So we've got Councillor Castle come back in. So that um, covers off the items that were raised by members of the public gallery this evening. We will now move back to the beginning of the agenda and deal with items that weren't moved on block in the order as they're presented in the agenda. The first item is item 9.10, the final adoption of the Local Government Property Amendment Local Law 2022. This is an absolute majority item. May I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Councillor Loden doing the hard yards. Feel free to show it around, guys. Moved. Councillor Castle seconded. Councillor Loden. Supportive of the officer recommendation. Sorry, uh, we just had a, a small concern that we had missed an item, but we didn't. Councillor Loden is supportive of the officer recommendation. Councillor Castle. Ditto. Any further speakers on this item? I will put it. All those in favour? To carry it carried unanimously. We'll now move on to item 9.11, outcome of advertising and adoption of new smoke-free areas and smoke-free areas education and enforcement policy. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Hallett moved. Councillor Wallace seconded. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. I'm happy to support this. I've commented um, a number of times previously, so I won't go on with this one again. It's great to see this. Um, get to this point and fully support the recommendation. Councillors, no comments? Any further comments? Councillor Alexander? Yes, through you, Deputy Mayor. The main way of info, the main way city will be enforcing this is through education. So we'll be working with the um, uh, you know, the local bars um, and all the venues in each of our town centres to educate them. And they're already pretty well, or they're very well, well aware of this. Um, from there, um, the city will, the rangers are obviously um, out and about in the city all the time. And we'll be really the first, the first step of this will be talking to people to explain to them um, what we're doing. There'll be signage up around no smoking in our town centres. Um, and our experience is that those, those um, acts alone, will essentially result in um, the, the smoke-free town centres being achieved. It's very unlikely we'll need to issue infringements. Um, and that's certainly not something that we're, we're looking to do. 
if we don't have to. Councillor Alexander, anything further? No, Councillor Arpele. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Mayor Cole, um, was a question to administration. Mayor Cole made a comment um, offline during the week about perhaps a, a question about what the appropriateness of the fines, and I'm not sure where that, she was looking for a reduction of the fines for infringements, and I'm not sure what administration's response was that for that. Where did it end up? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I did respond to Mayor Cole's question on that uh, during the week, uh, and we um, we uh, put the case that those uh, the fines were of sufficient value to provide some deterrent effect to uh, to people who um, may uh, not abide by uh, the signage and the intent of having uh, these areas as being smoke free. In, in her absence, she was like, okay with that, where that was resolved? Through you, Deputy Mayor, I didn't receive response from Mayor Cole on that. Anything further, Councillor Opelow? Um, Look, I'll just speak to it. A um, couple of things. I do note that the, uh, the education and enforcement policy does indicate that um, there will be a graduated and proportionate response to compliance in relation to this policy and that, uh, that there will be a transition period of like, education only for the first six months of implementation, So, um, which I think is a reasonable approach. Also want to note that um, I did go back to look at this item to confirm that Washing Lane was included in the smoke-free area and was very pleased to see that it was already in there, um, noting our, our approval in relation to application for closure and the increasing use of this area as a um, pedestrian space and for alfresco dining. Um, uh, but ultimately, yes, I'm very supportive of this item. It's in line with the um, City of Vincent Public Health Plan. Any further speakers? Right of reply? No. I will put it. All those in favour? That's unanimously carried. Okay, we'll now move on to item 9.12, the development compliance and enforcement policy, which I have pulled out for um, consideration. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Wallace, seconded Councillor Castle. Any comments? Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, no comments from me. I'm generally supportive. I'll leave the floor to you. Okay, thank you. I just had one question and it just relates to the uh, policy that we have just adopted um, and also the um, this proposed development enforcement uh, compliance enforcement policy um, that is uh, going to be put out for community consultation. Um, I note that this policy is proposes to replace um, the prosecution and enforcement policy that ultimately um, had a on paper scope that was related to everything but in practice was only used for development. Um, and I just wanted to, um, I guess, just get some confirmation in relation to the um, city's intention around other compliance and enforcement actions, specifically in relation to the enforcement of actions around food safety, noise, and um, I guess agreements with the city. Um, is it intended that the city will develop a um, standalone um, perhaps health compliance and enforcement policy to sit side by side this um, development compliance and enforcement policy uh, or is the um, compliance and enforcement of other, I guess, establishing a compliance enforcement regarding other matters that may intersect with, but not be com completely covered by this item. Um, how, how is it going to be addressed? I'm still a little unsure about the approach. Yes, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, the, the manager is here to um, provide some more detail on that. Hello, manager. Thank you Hi. very much. Throw to you. Yeah, um, to you, Deputy Mayor. Um, with the Public Health Act and the Food Act and other forms of health legislation, uh, compliance guidelines are developed by the state government to cover the, um, the statewide application of the legislation. I guess in many ways it's different to um, planning uh, legislation which is covered in the development compliance enforcement policy because each local government 
to have their own sort of individualised planning approach, whereas uh, we, for public health matters, we adopt the statewide approach and um, have a consist consistent approach with other local governments um, and use the policy of the Department of Health. So um, I asked this question because I'm actually drafting a compliance and employment policy at work at the moment, and I was on the Department of Health website in relation to food safety, and the Department of Health's current policy, compliance and enforcement policy for local governments appeared to suggest that local governments should have their own compliance and enforcement policy in relation to the Food Safety Act. I do note that the website I was looking at was not necessarily current, and I understand that there has been um, changes in that space. So um, uh, I guess I'm not going to ask a question. What I'm just going to say is I take uh, the manager's comments on board, and this is something that I guess I can um, perhaps confirm offline in relation to um, the... Uh, during the consultation period, I do note that it is the intention of administration where possible not to duplicate legislative or policy provisions of state government or to create policies that effectively just um, write down existing laws that are uh, present elsewhere, and I am very supportive of that approach. I'm also very supportive of having a development um, compliance and enforcement policy that is a usable policy document to guide decision-making and action from city offices and is transparent for our community. So I'm um, uh, thank you for that clarification. Um, I look forward to seeing if we get any responses to the consultation and um, we can uh, consider um, where we may have uh, policy gaps in this space um, over the coming months. Thank you. Is there anything further? No, that said, I will put it, all those in favour? Declare, declare it carried unanimously. We'll now move on to item 10.1, Halverson Hall tenant relocation. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Moved, Councillor Iopolo. Seconded, Councillor Loden. Councillor Iopolo. Thank you. Just a couple of questions following off from, on from the briefing session of administration. Um, and just because it's, it's dealing with the appropriate and best use of city property, I just want to cross the T's and dot the I's. Um, <clears throat> So the context is four individuals have a commercial lease on Halverson Hall and they've asked us to consider um, releasing them from that lease and, and granting a new lease on a different property, <clears throat> which is administration. This is on um, North Perth Community Centre. Did you finish your question? Uh, oh, I just thought... Councillor Apollo perhaps had a question. Did you want to? Okay. If, if I, yes, yeah, so through you, Chair, executive I may, director. I just probably just to make clear that uh, we approached the artists and made a suggestion that they move rather than them approach us. Just before you go any further, in case that's a Thank you, point, Executive yeah. Director. That's a useful clarification. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a change from uh, Halverson Hall to North Perth Community Centre. It's better conditioned and it's 50% larger. I guess my question is why? wasn't, why would, did we not consider a rent increase? Um, through you, Chair. Um, as I said, we approached the artists because uh, we felt that the expenditure required on Halverson Hall will ultimately be quite large and that, um, so in, in essence, the move was at our request and for our convenience. So that's why uh, an increase in rent wasn't um, considered at this point. Um, second question, um, if the property is better conditioned, why would we also um, being asked to transfer the $40,000 budget, which capital works budget that had been assigned to the hall to the new property, which we're saying is in a much better state? What, what, why would we look to do that for the benefit of the, the lessee? Yeah, through you, um, through you, Chair, again. It's essentially to prepare for occupation. We felt that if we uh, leased it to anybody, that it would those there's a small list of works like blinds and lights that need to prove uh, to, that need replacing, and whoever occupied it, we required. So essentially, it's it's to prepare for occupation. May I just follow on from that question, Councillor Like, Can I just um, assess? 
is administration of the view that the same um, capital works allocation is required for the for both properties and um, or is there the potential that after um, like does administration intend to spend the $40,000 uh, to the limit or is there, uh, there the potential that that full component won't be spent? If not, can you provide more detail around what will happen and how it will come back to council? Yes, we chair. So there is forty thousand dollars budget. I think the estimate's thirty thousand to do those works, but obviously we'd like a little contingency because just in case we find something we're not aware of, so there is a chance the full budget won't be um, spent, and that will be returned to council at mid year review. And um, just one more question. Um, I guess for all intents and purposes, the rent for these four individuals is what you would call peppercorn in a sense that it's one hundred and twenty dollars a week for a commercial property, um, $128 per week, sorry. Um, at the same time, and my question to administration is, what is the service that they're providing that has the community benefit? Because it wasn't that clear to me in the briefing note, but I did note a comment that the city's property management framework categorises these tenants as category three, where their service is generally not within the remit of local government and not unique, specific, and meeting a high level of need. If you can just talk to that, please. Uh, through the chair, um, in uh, the original lease that was um, uh, provided to the artists uh, for the other property that they're in, there was uh, some consideration in respect to uh, what they deliver to the city, uh, uh, considering that the city doesn't have any other uh, similar types of uh, art provision specifically, and certainly doesn't have an art gallery and doesn't have that, um, that community nature of that art provision. Um, and that as a consequence, some discounting of the rental would be appropriate for that particular category three, um, uh, lease. I'm not sure if that answered my question. I, I'm just trying to get some guidance as to why the rent's so low. If we're saying that this is not a, given that you've said it's a category three, whatever that means, because if it, if you said it, look, this is this is the service that they're providing the community. It's it's you know generally accepted that what they're they're providing is um, you know it's a not for profit and it's um, providing substantive services and, and the community is very happy about it, then I absolutely will support the use of city property at peppercorn rent. But I just, I didn't get that, that you know, I'm not familiar with this lease, uh, so I've needed some, I just like some... Um, Councillor Opelot, if I could provide some... Uh, yeah, perhaps sure. my interpretation of Council's previous decision, it related to the alignment of the offering with the City of Vincent's Arts Development Plan um, and I believe that it was considered that there was a community benefit in having a uh, making available city owned facility for commercial artists so that we could you know encourage commercial artists to live and work within the city of Vincent and we saw that as being a benefit to the broader city community in realizing the goal of that uh, plan in making the city of Vincent the arts capital of Perth and uh, I think also there was a recognition that there was um, some community benefit in having access to local arts activity classes and activities, but also through open art studios, et cetera. So yes, you're correct. It was always considered as a, um, a commercial lease, but there was um, some consideration given to the alignment of that commercial activity with uh, a, a, an approved plan of the city and approved um, I guess, approved actions that came out of that plan. Thanks, that clarifies it. So um, I'm not sure if that meant they are definitely not for profit or not, but um, I, I, if I can just get an answer to that question specifically, and lastly, I promise this is the last one, um, it, given that there is a broad community benefit for them to do this, is this a, is this a lease exclusive? Does they have exclusive use? So if other artists wanted to use the space, um, I just want to make sure that if they're getting a peppercorn rent, that other artists would have the ability to use it. Um, is that a no? 
I'll let the executive manager governance. I have my own understanding of the answer to that question, but I will re refer to administration. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, in respect to the lease arrangement, the lease arrangement uh, is with the four individuals concerned, and if any additional person that would came into it, they'd become a party of that lease through some variation, or if one of the parties left and someone else came in, that would be a variation uh, to the lease. Um, the community benefit, I believe, is uh, in respect to the, the services that those that group of four provide in respect to uh, I thought it was the last question, but I'm just still not quite comfortable. Yeah, I'll make no more promises. Um, so would you envisage a situation that if another artist wanted to use the space for their own art, that they would be charged a fee from these people which would exceed, you know, the rent? Like they, they would, I, I want to know if these people are making a profit from it or are they, are they actually offering a commercial, a, a community service? Because the rent is very, very low and we're giving them a better, better property and we're still committing to, to, to expend like $30,000 potentially of capital works for what is a uh, five or $6,000 rent per year. So clearly it's not, we, it's a negative cash flow for us. Um, but I just don't, I just don't want the, the, the four individuals that, uh, that we're talking about um, are going to profit exclusively from this. And I haven't had an answer to the, whether it's a, a profit a not for profit or not. Uh, through the chair, uh, strictly then they are not a charity. It is a lease to four individuals that happen to be artists and they require the space to be able to uh, 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 do their art and they, like many artists, will sell their art as a consequence of them doing the art. So um, it is a, a essentially a quasi-commercial arrangement. I can't confirm uh, what amount of money they may earn either through um, uh, the sale of their art or performing um, uh, opportunities or workshops for the community in respect to uh, uh, art, um, but they do have exclusive use in respect to the space. Anything further? Councillor Alexander. Could I ask who, and I've got to declare an interest here, my wife attends the North Perth Centre or whatever it's called with a City of Vincent writing group. Um, could I just ask who the other people are that use the, the North Perth Hall? Oh, this, uh, is, and, this relates and, to um, and, Halverson Hall on Robertson Park and the Vincent community. There's a commun North Perth the Community Centre on... No, on oh. uh, Farmer Street and oh. Namur Street uh, on Woodville Reserve. That so, they're going to. Yeah. Okay. Well, who currently uses the one that the artists are going to go to? So is it empty or is someone going to be evicted? or? Yeah, yeah through, through you, uh, Chair. Uh, it's vacant. It's been vacant for some time. It was okay. leased but never occupied and it's been the lease has expired and it's been vacant, so we won't be evicting anyone to put them in. No, okay. Pleased to hear no one's going to get evicted. Especially my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Loden. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for the questions that uh, probed in a bit more detail. Um, I'm supportive of this. I recognise it's probably not the ideal situation that you're seeing here in terms of how this cost is, is allocated, uh, but um, it is a good option for the city to, to free up this space with Halverston Hall and avoid those costs. So I, I support that. It's, um, I think there's probably an opportunity to look at how this can work better and be better utilised by the city in the future, but I'm happy to allow this to be approved and to make that shift happen so we can achieve that benefit and we can work towards improving outcomes and deliverables from the, this lease in the future. I recognise that is four years away, four years away. Um, but I think that's probably still the best outcome with what we have in front of us here. We could look to defer it and try and renegotiate and stuff like that, but I, I suspect that the there is probably limited capacity for this group to pay more in rent 
um, I guess probably the big opportunity is how we can work with them to achieve a better community outcome and greater engagement with the community. This location might actually help with that engagement more as well. So um, that's something that we can probably, I'm not going to propose an amendment, but that would be a great thing for the, the city to administration to reflect on and how we can improve those outcomes. Thank you. Councillor Wallace. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I was just wondering, given this space is a lot larger than, how, or somewhat larger than Halverson's Hall, was any consideration given to giving them a lease over part of the area and reserving the rest of the area for uh, community use? Uh, through you, um, Chair, uh, it wasn't. Where they are in Halverson Hall, they're absolutely squashed in, so they actually need the extra space. So um, from that perspective, no, we, weren't, we didn't consider subdividing or letting it to anybody else. If you actually went to Halverson Hall now, you'll find that fire exits can be blocked because they, you know, the way they, they have to store materials like clay, it really is a, you know, a, poor, um, a poor premises for them. It's a real struggle, so they do need the additional space. Councillor Hallett. Just another question. Um, for Halverson Hall, my understanding was that this original 40 grand was required for some upgrades now, but potentially in the future to be consistent with our asset sustainability strategy, we would require significant more investment. Is that true? Yeah, so you definitely made that. That's correct. It's, it's in the attachment. Um, the money we're proposing to spend on Halverson Hall was really scratching the surface just to make it barely functional, but it did nothing for the compliance. Things like the toilets are really bad. So um, we were reluctant to spend that money on there at all because of the quality of the, pro of the property. So um, we were anticipating spending somewhere close to $200,000 to get the other stuff sorted at some point in the lifetime of the building. So, so um, yeah, this is a better option from an asset perspective. Councillor Castle. Thank you, Chair. May as well speak since everyone else is. Um, uh, look, I'm supportive. I think there's a number of benefits to the city um, in making this switch. One has just been outlined as the savings to the future costs of uh, repairing and bringing Halverson Hall up to compliance. That can be avoided. I'm interested to hear um, in the future what the plans are for that building and what, um, what options we might have available. As the Director said, this property's been sitting vacant for some time. We have had previous tenants with leases negotiated who never took um, possession. So um, it not only uh, solves a problem in relation to Halverson Hall, it also makes use of a community asset that we have sitting vacant. So I think that's a good outcome for the city uh, for a relatively small cost and um, for a benefit that can be appreciated and enjoyed by many members of the community and is in alignment with our, our strategies. Thanks. Um, Councillor Warner, did you wish to speak? I think everyone else has had a go. <clears throat> um, I feel like I, I need to be wearing my, um, my arts hat here to basically say, look, I, I'm really supportive of any, any push that we have here to, to support our artists in our community. Um, so I, I think that this is what we're doing here. And as Councillor Castle said, it actually does solve a few other issues with um, resolving the the problems at Halverson Hall and occupying a, an other otherwise vacant space. So, I look. I'm really supportive of any any initiative that we have to support artists in our community. Thank you, Councillor Warner. Um, look, I'm going to speak to this too. I think um, ultimately, I think that uh, the City of Vincent's Arts Development Plan considers like emerging. Uh, artists, they also consider the general community and our love and exposure to the arts, but they do, it does actually also does consider professional artists. And in that plan, we make the commitment that we will identify support and partner with artists and arts, arts organisations operate in the city of Vincent. Part of this has come forward because we've had a professional art collective that has been operating out of Halverson Hall for over, I think it's over 20 years, continuous occupation within that space. And um, having visited Halverson Hall, I felt that it was not really appropriate for us to be thinking about um, potentially knocking over a, a dilapidated building with no real consideration for uh, what might happen to the arts, uh, <laughs> professional artists that occupy it. 
Um, do thank administration for trying to think outside the box as to how we might address these problems um, of our asset maintenance schedule and um, providing a positive outcome for both uh, the city's uh, coffers and also for the um, artists themselves. Um, I guess without doing the sort of net present value calculations, um, my view is this is a five-year lease, we're getting six grand a year, and there's about $30,000 worth of works required. So I see this as being a fairly neutral investment. The community benefit comes from being um, that we are supporting our professional artists who live and work in the city. Also helps us to achieve our other aims in relation to, um, you know, having people be able to get off their uh, out of their cars and work maybe closer to where they live so they can walk or ride and um, meet our accessible city aims as well. Um, I do have a question in relation to the. Um, I did have some questions in relation to the the lease and the um, uh, suitability of having a commercial artist collective. Um, uh, operating some commercial activity on a reserve where our lease um, is requires it for, to be for the purpose of recreation. However, I'm satisfied to proceed and obtain the formal decision um, of the Minister for Planning, Lands and Heritage. No, who is it? Minister for Lands uh, will be asked to provide an assessment in relation to the suitability of the um, proposed lease in terms of the uh, restrictions that may be on the reserve. I also do note that when, um, oh gosh, I think it was Graham, who came from the Halverson Hall Artist Studio, came to here and spoke about in favour of the move. He did speak about their um, desire to collaborate with the men's shed and the community garden on projects, which I do think will amplify the benefit of this potential move. So I'm supportive of the officer recommendation um, as written. Anything further? No, I will put the item. Oh, Councillor Iopolo. Yes. My apologies. Um, look, I, I am a big lover of the arts too. I mean, I did produce films in LA and work for Disney and, and Warner Brothers and an independent production company, so I absolutely for the arts. Um, I just, I guess my problem is that the 40000 we're talking about on, that's asking to be transferred is not for the whole period of the lease. It's uh, my understanding it's FY23 budget, which says 22, 23, but 22 is gone. Um, the... If this was something that was available to all artists to use, in like in a co co working space, that people, even though you might have four individuals who are basically anchoring the tenancy, but also giving subject to space, other people to come in and work um, and show their art, or um, I I would totally get it, but I don't. I just have trouble with this one in terms of use of city property um, where it's not that situation. This is a a private lease to specific individuals running a, a profit-making venture, even though it's in the art space, um, not to say that they are making profit, I don't know, but it is a very low rent. So, um, you know, on that basis, if the lease, I'm only making these comments so that next time it comes up, we might have further due consideration of these types of points. Um, but at this point, I find it really probably, I mean, I probably don't support it on that basis. Thank you, Councillor Arpolo. I'll put it, all those in favour? All those against? Councillor Aopolo and Councillor Wallace voting against. Call it carried. We'll now move on to the financial statements at, at 31 May 2022, item 11.1. It's an absolute majority item. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item, please? Councillor Loden. Councillor Hallett seconded. Councillor Loden? Councillor Hallett? Any debate? I'll put it. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Move on to item 11.7, extension of lease and deed of contract to Belgravia Health and Leisure Group, Party Limited, Loftus Recreation Centre, portion of Lot 50199 Loftus Street, Leaderville. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this item, please? Councillor Alphalo moved. And Councillor Wallace seconded. Councillor Alphalo. Thanks. Just a couple of questions again. It's, it's more about crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Um, there was a comment made about the contract variation is proposing a 50% reduction in land tax. Um, I just, is this a waiver or a deferral? Uh, so through you, Mayor, um, Deputy Mayor, 
um, since the uh, this is actually a newly um, imposed tax on this particular tenant. Um, so there was a change in definition interpretation by um, the regulator. And uh, given that um, this is effectively a joint venture business and um, there are constraints placed by the city on Belgravia as to how they use the land and through the management agreement, which restricts them from being able to trade freely and therefore be able to maximise their return to compensate for that tax, um, it was determined that in the, the spirit of the um, agreement that it would be a shared imposition. But the way that that will be imposed is through a reduction of the fee paid in the management agreement um, to the equivalent of that value. So they're they're paying us um, for they're paying us in the management agreement, and then we're going to just reduce it by that fifty percent equivalent value. So just to clarify, they weren't obligated to pay land tax in the previously, Correct. but now they're effectively paying fifty percent. Correct. Happy with that. Yep. Thank you. Um, second one, council approved the grant of an extension to the lease for a, um, when this sorry when the lease came up last time. Yep. Council had decided to only grant a five-year lease and not a 10-year lease. Correct. What we were effectively doing now is giving them that five years. Correct. Um, the reason cited by council at the time for only doing a five-year lease at the time yep. was that uh, because of the development of the Leaderville um, Oval Master Plan. Yes. What's changed then for us to now grant another five years? Uh, so through you, Deputy Mayor, I think um, that was certainly part of the conversation, but you may recall there was um, some commentary from existing councillors at briefing last week, which I suppose added a little bit more context, which I found helpful. And I was able to confirm that by going back through the city's records over the last week, um, which was that there was a discussion by council at the time um, about a desire to um, test the market at the five-year mark rather than the 10-year mark with regards to the management agreement. And that was the reason why, um, and, and also the Leadville Oval Master Plan was in development. So there was a number of things happening five years ago that impacted on um, the, the decision at that time. Um, and uh, my recommendation to council and administration's recommendation, I should say, is based on the fact that what, what has been unprecedented um, at this point, it has been the impact of COVID on the business um, and the, the fact that the business has been um, uh, detrimentally impacted over the last two years and Belgravia now has a, a fee that's required to be repaid through a waiver. Um, and also the COVID um, environment has impacted on the city's ability to also um, go through a adequate review process and to enter into a competitive tendering um, environment right now. So in our view, this is not the optimal time for us to um, test the market, which was what was intention, what was intended five years ago. I'll, Can I'll, I just, just also just to clarify your specific question yes. in relation to the rationale is yes. would it also be fair to say that council has never adopted a leadable oval master plan? And oh. so the reasoning that was considered there was that it would have been likely that council had intended to adopt a leader below master plan in that time. And so that may have had some bearing on whether a further lease would be entered into or, you know, the facilities on the site that hasn't happened. So. Thanks for that clarification. And that's, yeah. that was the nature of my question. So Sorry. are yeah. we, are we effectively saying, or is administration saying that in the, in the next five years, it doesn't think that the adoption of the Leadable Oval Master Plan is something that would um, be in conflict with the granting of a five-year lease. So this is going to be put on the back burner. Yeah, through you, Deputy Mayor, I, I would confirm that, yeah. Okay. Um, and my third question um, is in relation to the recommendation of 1.2.2, where it says the lesser and lessee to agree an annual pro program of capital works. Yep. Um, to include the allocation of the Loftus <laughs> Recreation Fund for the purposes of facilitating venue improvements and capital purchases to assist in maintaining the facility and improving profitability of the Loftus Recreation Centre. The question is, are these additional obligations on the City of Vincent as lessor over and above what was required under the current lease? And, and has this been provided under the FY23 capital budget? 
Yeah, so through you, um, Deputy Mayor, there is no additional obligation on the city. So um, really, uh, this was a commitment that um, the lessor and lessee agreed to make explicit in our, um, uh, uh, I suppose, our working arrangements going forward. Um, the lessee is making a contribution into the fund, but there's been no clarity as to how that fund was going to be expended. And there's been a disconnect between the expenditure of that fund and optimising that in such a way that the business benefits or that, um, for example, um, uh, fixing that part of the facility will have the best return on the business's performance, for example. It's allowing the lessee and the lessor to agree um, that capital works program in a little bit more detail. There is no additional capital budget um, implied in that agreement. It's really more about um, both parties agreeing to optimise the spend and to do it cooperatively, if that makes sense. Clarify my question. Yeah. So in the existing lease that has lapsed, yeah. did, were they required, was the lessee required to make an annual, did, Correct. Uh, did, sorry, were the parties agreeing to, in the same mm -hmm. way, uh, uh, an annual program of capital works? Uh, so through you, Mayor, there was a, there's a requirement that they pay money into the reserve, um, but there wasn't an agreement as to how the capital works program would be managed or facilitated. Okay, and the amount they're contrib contributing, is it going to be the same? Or you uh, uh, propose, because it's vague, it doesn't say the amount, you're saying that the parties are going to agree to it yeah. as part of the lease. Is, are we anticipating it'll be the same? Yeah, so um, through Deputy Mayor, yes. It's, so the conditions for contributing to the reserve are unchanged. Um, they're defined in the contract. Um, this is about agreeing how that is going to be expended. And lastly, when we say that the parties are going to agree, is that coming back to, once you've decided how much that capital works would be, yeah. is that going to come back through the annual capital budgeting process or is it some, or will council be consulted on how much we're willing to spend or is it just something that we're effectively giving delegated authority to the CEO to determine? Yeah, um, yeah through you, Mary, absolutely council will approve every, every instance of how the reserve or the capital works is expended. Anything further? No, okay, I'll put it, all those in favour. That's carried unanimously. I believe that was the last item on our agenda. Uh, thank you everybody for who attended in the chamber tonight and who was watching on the live stream. I will declare the meeting closed at 8.29 p.m.